everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me. I had uh, Jared put that song up there on the overhead, Nothing But the Blood of Yeshua, an old classic gospel song that we all probably know by heart. Um, who, can make, who can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Yeshua. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Yeshua. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Nothing, no other font I know. Nothing but the blood of Yeshua. Or blood of Jesus, as most people would know that song by. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Yeshua. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Yeshua. Nothing can... For sin atone, nothing but the blood of Yeshua. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Yeshua. And then there's other verses. We read in Revelation 12, 11, and it's a verse some of you probably know by heart. He's talking about where Satan, the devil, in the end times comes against the evil one. Uh, comes against the saints. And it says of the saints in verse 11 of Revelation 12, that they overcame the serpent by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and they love not their life unto death. I think that we're going to understand what that verse means more clearly, um, in, especially in, in these Western countries where most of us live, uh, than ever before. I, I suspect that those who live in places like China and North Korea and in Muslim countries and in places in Africa and the Middle East and elsewhere, some of the, the, the Cuba and some of the fascist uh, countries, uh, socialistic countries, communist, Marxist, whatever, totalitarian countries where they have uh, uh, tried to suppress uh, Bible believers and the, and the Bible and Christianity and so forth, I suspect they have a better understanding of what this verse means from practical experience better than maybe we do who've had it pretty easy here in the United States of America or other Western countries for so long. But that's about to change. And so I think we're, we, we would do well to explore and to meditate on and to understand, can we make sure all the lights are up? We're, I think we're missing some lights here. We need all the lights we can get on here. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I think we're going to have a better understanding of what that means. I think that as we hear, much better, even those backlights help. Um, even, you know, as we go, as we go along in our walk, or let's say Christianity as a whole in this nation, mainstream Christianity, I think some of these less um, palatable things like blood become um, less politically correct to talk about. We have become, uh, and I'm not, I don't mean this in any demeaning way, uh, femininity is a wonderful thing. True femininity, femininity as defined by the Bible. But it's not a wonderful thing when men are effeminate. It's also not a wonderful thing when women usurp um, masculine roles. This is something that fits, does not fit the biblical paradigm. But I, I want to say that men, largely speaking, it's been an assault, an, an assault societally on men and upon the head of the family. And so men uh, in this society, have, many of them have become effeminate, even, you know, in, their, in how they talk. And, and, you know, you see it all the time. I mean, I was getting a, some coffee at Starbucks the other day for my wife. And it was on Passover Eve, it was just before Passover started. And I'm, I'm in line and there's this, he's a, he, he, like this, and this guy ordering coffee. And he's, I, mean, I can't even imitate it. But you know what I mean. It's just this, this affected kind of a way. And it's probably not his fault. He probably never had a man. And half the people in this state, in this state, do not have their father. The kids do not have their biological father living in their house with them or do, do not know who their father is. Or their father is gone. And the mother's trying to raise them. God bless her for that. But a man takes a man to raise a son. And it takes a woman, a mother, to raise a daughter. And one who's in the house. So we have a lot of brokenness. And it's, 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 a, it's, it's not the kid's fault. They were born into it. But we have, we have this, the family has been broken apart. 
And so you have men, and then you have this assault on manliness, starting, I don't know when it started, back in the 60s, a lot of the situation, situation comedies and the cartoons in Hollywood, where the man was the buffoon of the, of the whole thing. I mean, you can go back to Archie Bunker, or even before that. I don't think it was so much in the 50s, but you know, it really started in the mid to late 60s. And there's been an attack on the women too. I mean, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's an attack on, on, on biblical values and on true masculinity and femininity. Not saying that it existed prior to this. There was all in society. There's always been excesses and, and imbalances. But the point is, get back to people don't want to talk about blood. I grew up on a farm, and I've seen plenty of blood. Now, I, God bless you, brother, for fighting in the Vietnam War. I see your hat. You know, you, I mean, I don't know what you did, but, but I, I've, had, I've had the honor to talk to a lot of Vietnam vets who were out there on the front lines they don't even want to talk about, as well as World War II. You know, I mean, I, I, haven't, I, mean, I haven't experienced that kind of blood. But on the farm, we did our own slaughtering, and blood doesn't bother me. But I haven't been where this brother probably has, or some, uh, I don't know if we have any other combat veterans in this, in this congregation or not. But anyway, um, today, but, but, you know, people don't like to talk about blood. And they get squeamish. And because, because we, have been, we have been effeminized, the men. And, and the gospel message has been as well. They don't want to talk, you know, all these pictures of Jesus hanging on the cross. Look, it, that's not what he looked like. The Mel Gibson movie, that's probably more like what he looked like. If, you, if any of you had the stomach to watch that, and chunks of flesh flying off of him. And there was blood splattered all over in the courtyard as they're whipping him with the cat of nine tails. I mean, that thing, it ripped chunks of blood out of him when they're, you know, 39 lashes and it's pulling with the pieces of metal and the, and, and the bone in there. And he's being whipped. He didn't, you know, this sanitized nonsense. That's what he did for our sins. That's the price he had to pay. His face was marred more than, I wasn't even going to preach about this. This is not what I'm preaching about. This is before the prayer time. But the Lord, I read that, I heard him saying that song, it stirred my heart. I want to tell you something. It, we, we've got a sanitized vision of Yeshua. Or they, the church calls him Jesus Christ. It's a sanitized, cleaned up vision, a version of everything. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, the church has been Jezebel, no, the Jezebel whore system, now I'm talking real plainly here, has Ahabized the church. So now most of your pastors are Mr. Rogers in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, and I've talked about that before too. Now God bless Mr. Rogers, All, a lot of people grew up watching him, and he's dead now, may he rest in peace. And, and, and he, you know, did his thing. And there's nothing wrong with that for Mr. Rogers in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. But for Mr. Rogers to get up in the pulpit and to preach the gospel, there's something wrong. Look, a shepherd had a shepherd, staff, and a rod. I grew up raising sheep and other livestock. In my farm, in a farm I was raised on, the shepherd's staff was the fences around the sheep. We had numerous pastors, and it was my job to keep those fences so that, to, to protect the sheep. That was to guide the sheep to keep them where it was safe. The rod was the shotgun or the 22 or the baseball bat or the pitchfork, whatever I could grab first, it was at the back door. When I had to go out and protect the poultry or the, or the, or the, or the uh, sheep or whatever else we had. The cattle, they, never didn't, they didn't have a problem. But the sheep, yeah, we had dogs got in there and killed a few. And, 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 and you know, we had, to, I mean, we had all kinds of things. And I had to shoot some things to protect the animals. That's what a shepherd does. And that's what a shepherd in a, you know, that's what a, that's, that's the thing that Jehovah used as, as somebody that should be protect, protecting his flock. Because there's wolves that come in. Okay, so we got a lot of Mr. Rogers, sadly. They, they talk big. They, I don't, I'm not picking on you. Oh, that's what you're, got some here, his last name is Rogers. I'm not picking on you, brother. I wasn't even thinking about you. I know you as Mr. Ed. When I think of you, I talk and think of Mr. Ed, the talking horse. 
But that's a, but sorry, you can't win either way. Sorry about that. No, I don't think it. Well, that's how you sign your emails. I mean, you did. It's your. I mean, that's your. I mean, I can't help it. That's I was raised in the '60s. I I think of Mr. Ed the Talking Horse. I can't help it. <laughs> you young kids, you need to go. You have no clue what we're talking about. It was a TV show about a horse that talked. <laughs> anyway. But anyway, back to reality or seriousness. I, his face is all red now, but thankfully he's not on the camera. I guess I should be the one to have a red face. But anyway, but I don't shame too easily. Uh, but anyway, but the, the gospel message has been, been, been sanitized. It's been dumbed down. And it's been emasculated, largely speaking. And a lot of it is because they've, they've eviscerated of its Torah. And that started back in the early 2nd century with the so-called anti-Nicene Church Fathers. And that's a whole other discussion. We won't go there. We've taught about that before. But we need to talk about the blood. We need to talk about repentance. We need to talk about sin. I was interviewing a young man the other day. I won't say who or what. Not necessary. I said, tell me your testimony. And he claims to be a Christian. He's about, I don't know, 21 years old or so. Claims to be a Christian. God bless him. He was raised in church. And at 16, he made a decision. And I asked him, I said, you know, did you, did you was there an altar call? Did you go up, you know, make a, what did you do? Well, I, you know, I made a decision for Jesus and I talked to my pastor. And then he let me know that he wasn't baptized. I'm like, what kind of a pastor is this? The guy led this young man into salvation, as the church understands it, and, and then he didn't, he didn't even baptize him for the remission of sins, which is the first thing you're supposed to do. I mean, like immediately was what the gospel. And then I asked him, well, did you repent of your sins? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, what is sin? He didn't have a clue. He did not, he barely had a clue. He was grasping for words. I mean... He was not raised or discipled in any kind of a church that taught him anything. He says, well, you know, it's basically, it's try to be a good person and do good things. And it's not going like, slick. I said, I let him fish around and kind of twist in the wind for a little bit as he's trying to grow up. And he said, well, I, I, you know, he was searching for words. And I said, well, sin is a violation of the Torah, the law, the Ten Commandments. Well, he kind of had a vague idea what the Ten Commandments were, and, and so we could start on that basis, and I instructed him. This is really sad. A beautiful, wonderful young man. He just had not been educated, and he had not been taught how to read his Bible, and, you know, I don't know what, you know, I mean, I, I don't know the whole thing, but I talked to him for a good hour, trying to kind of help him to, you know, understand where he was coming from and where he's at in his spiritual walk. We have a whole millions of Christians that are like that, sadly. And maybe some of you were like that too. But anyway, the blood. Let's get, let's get back to the blood. You know, the blood of Yeshua in the New Testament or the Testament of Yeshua, there's as about as many places as it says blood of Jesus or Yeshua as it says blood of Christ or blood of the Messiah. So let me just say right now, this is tangential. The idea that the Messiah is the divine part of Yeshua, the divine part, and, and I've heard this, and I've even kind of believe this, and that, that, that Jesus or Yeshua is the, the, the human part. Now we do believe that he's the God-man, that he's God in the flesh, incarnate. I believe in the incarnation. There's no question about it. But, um, we, we, um, but the Bible talks about the blood of Messiah as well as the blood of Yeshua. Well, the divine part doesn't have any blood. So I, I don't see the scriptures talking about that uh, differentiating between the Messiah and Yeshua. It was all, I mean, it's a miracle how it all came together. It's called the hy hypostasis or hypostatic union if you want to use good Christian theology. But, um, uh, and, and that's from a Greek word. And I have to remember what that means. But anyway, um, but, but Yeshua, there's about 50 references to the blood of Yeshua in the New Testament, the Testament of Yeshua. And if you look them up, all of them have to do with what this song, Nothing But the Blood of Yeshua, is all about. It has to do with redemption. It has to do with paying the price for sins. That's what it's about. Blood had to be spilled. 
Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Uh, Hebrews 9.22, based on um, Leviticus 17.11. Now, don't go down the path like I heard one so-called Torah teacher, who is a believer in Yeshua, who's on the radio, and that's all I'm going to say, I heard it with my own ears, I've heard him say this twice, says that there's other ways to be redeemed from your sins other than the blood of Yeshua. Now this came over, this came over, I mean I heard this last week, this week. And, and he was trying to make a point of it. Well, you know, you can be saved by the holy half shekel, because the holy half shekel redeems you from, it says, for, it, was, it was given for atonement. Oh, that's, yeah, right. Well, he didn't think very deeply on this subject, did he? Been there. I've done that. I got a wrote, wrote an article. Yeah, they pulled, paid the holy half shekel, the Israelites did, in the wilderness. And it was, and it said it was made, it was for atonement for sins. But let me ask you this. What was the holy half shekel used for? To finance the temple service. Including all that was necessary to make those sacrifices on the altar of sacrifice happen. Somebody had to buy the firewood. Somebody had to pay somebody to go out and get it. And, 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 all, and those morning and evening Olah Tamid sacrifices, the burnt offering, somebody had to go out and buy the, 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 the bulls and the lambs that were sacrificed. Now, some of them were given, for, given by people that were offering up a sin offering. But those ones were done every day and all on the Sabbaths and all the biblical holidays, the feasts. Somebody had to pay for that. That holy half cycle went for that, among other things. So you were contributing to the sacrificial system that was there, that was a picture of Yeshua dying on the cross. So, 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 forget that one. Okay? It says that he, and then he went on to say that, well, you know, they offered up, they offered up um, um, flour. When, if they couldn't afford to bring an offering, um, for um, a, um, you know, uh, if they sinned and they couldn't afford to bring an offering, uh, a bull or a goat or whatever, they could bring flour. Oh? Really? Well, I see that in the minka offering, or the meal offering, or cereal offering, or the meat offering, depending on what Bible version you have, but in Hebrew it's the minka. But I want to go read about the Minka offering in Leviticus. I don't see anything there where it talks about atonement for sin. That was the burnt offering. That was the Olah Tamid. That was the trespass offering and the sin offering. But you also had the peace offering and you had the meal offering. And it doesn't say that they were an atonement for sin. There's like five offerings, actually six if you include the, the, um, the wine offering, the wine libation. Now, the meal offering was offered up in conjunction with the burnt offering, and it's a picture of the body of Yeshua. But you don't have redemption just through the body of Yeshua. There has to be spilled blood, because blood is a picture of life. Look, you can't live without your blood. That's where the life is in. I, I mean, it's a miracle. Nobody understands it. It's just something that Elohim has set up. And so blood is a picture of life essence. And that price had to be paid to pay for our sins because of the wages of sin, which is death. So that idea doesn't, that this guy gave out over the radio, that doesn't hold any water. He's, a, he's the head of a group of Torah teachers, and he's leading this thing. I think he needs to go back to 101 or something. And then he went on and said, well, you know, then we, we have, you know, Elohim just outright forgave people. Well, he did. He gave, forgave them for that particular sin, but that doesn't mean they had everlasting life, and it doesn't mean that, they, that all their other sins were forgiven, and so forth and so on. It doesn't mean that they, were, that they had eternal life. I mean, there's a bigger picture here. You still, there needs to be shedding of blood to pay for our sins, and Yeshua's blood was efficacious in this, because, can you turn that heater down? I turned it up, and now it's getting too warm in here. Yeah, it was cold. Now it's getting too warm. Just turn it down. I don't know. It's at 68, whatever. Just turn it down. Thank you. 
You just Yeah, there you go. Just push the button until it gets where you want. Thank you. So Yeshua's blood, he, as I've said many times, his blood was efficacious to pay for all of our sins because the Bible says it again and again and again. He is the one that created us. I mean, John 1.1 1, 1 says that, or 2, whatever verse it is. He's the one that created us. And so as the creator, as the word of Elohim that was made flesh, and, who created, and by him all things were made, his life is worth more than all of our lives because the thing that creates is more valuable than the thing that's created. We've been over that point many times. And he's the builder of the house, so to speak. And well, it says that in Hebrews or wherever that is. That's why his life was worth more than just an ordinary human being. And he could die for everybody's. So when, when, when people come along and say, well, we don't need the blood, and I really get testy about this, because there's, there's, there's people misguided, misguided, they don't know any better, but misguided people in rabbinic Judaism. They call themselves anti-missionaries because they're going against the Jews for Jesus kinds of people. And there's people that make this their ministry, and they say, and they try to pull out scriptures out of just and they and they use these same arguments that you don't need the death of the Messiah to atone for your sins I guess they never read Isaiah 53 oh that applies to the nation of Israel oh really and that's the argument they use oh really then how comes it talks about he in the singular, not it or the nation, but it's talking about one individual in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Yeshua, that's the, I mean, that, you don't have to go any further than that. The sins of us all were laid on his shoulders, not the nation. How can a nation die for your sins? Give me a break. That's, that's cramming, cramming, cramming it to fit and painting it to match. Okay, that's the blindness that's on the eyes. I understand that. And, and, the, and that blindness, they'll look upon him whom they pierced, and they will accept Yeshua when, they, when he comes back. And many have accepted him. Many among Judah, we've got some in this room who are of Judah who have accepted. Hallelujah. I mean, the apostles and Yeshua and all the early believers were all of Yehud, or loosely speaking, some were Benjamin like Paul or Levi. I think Matthew was a Levite. No, he was a tax collector. Ah, some of them, whatever. Well, John, John the Baptist was a Levite. He was a Cohen. Cohen. But anyway, um, so, um, so, so, so these arguments don't hold water. Scripturally. You, you can't get around the blood of Yeshua. Oh, okay, I want to just finish with this. I study a lot. I've been studying things for years. I'm a, I'm a researcher. Do you realize, and I don't want to go into this too much, but do you realize the importance of blood when it comes to satanic and occult rituals? Human sacrifice, animal sacrifices. Look, I've studied this, again, for research purposes. I've watched the videos. I've heard the testimonies. I've researched it deeply. As deep as I want to go, not that deeply, but I mean deep, deep enough for 30 years. They believe, and that sometimes you've got to study the dark side. I'm not advocating this. I, I hate to put it over, but sometimes, I, I hate to say this, but sometimes the church has lost the truth in certain things that sometimes you've got to go study the counterfeit of what the devil has done and, 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 and then do the reverse of it and find that in the scriptures. The devil, I mean, this is really bad sounding, and I'm not advocating it. But as a leader, sometimes you can't find the truth. They've got, the devil's got counterfeits out there. And I'm not advocating going in that direction. That's the highway to the lake of fire. But they take blood seriously. They believe there's power in it. I, this is really, I'm very passionate about it, if you couldn't tell. They believe there's power in it. They believe if they drink the blood of children and of virgins and of this and of that, that that will come into them and they'll get power. And it con they conjure up demons around, you know, in a pentagram and all this stuff. And it works for them as far as bringing demons. But at the same time, it's I don't understand it. It's bizarre. 
That same blood of Yeshua also frightens them and scares them off. That's why we can overcome the, you know, they, they have a twisted, a twisted demonic concept of blood. And it's just, it's just, there aren't words to describe how, how ribald and how, 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 you know, I, I don't even have the words, how perverted and demented it is. But they take more seriously, sometimes blood, more than the Christians do. Because, oh, that's blood, it makes me squeamish. Sometimes the devil is more, let's use another example. Sometimes the devil and the devil's religious systems like Islam. So, and, and I can list some cults. Some of the cults running around out there going door to door are more serious about spreading their message that's perverted or downright demonic. Look at Islam. By the sword of Allah, you shall conquer. That's their, that's their mantra. Go read the Quran. I have, cover to cover. See what it says. They are more zealous in many cases about spreading what they believe in than we are. Not, uh, not to demean the Christian missionaries have gone out there and laid their lives down and done a great job spreading the gospel. Praise the Lord for that. But sometimes the devil is more serious about his work than we are. I'm, I'm not, talking, not talking about anybody here. Particular. I'm just talking in general. Please don't get offended unless the shoe fits and put it on. And let the Holy Spirit convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We all need to do more. But we need to get serious. And, and um, look at, let me give you another example. I mean, there are examples all around us. You go to a, a football stadium or any sporting event and you got these people, thousands of them in, in, in the stadium, jumping up and down and, and you know, hooting and hollering over a, a football or a basketball or a baseball and screaming and shouting. They call them fans, short for fanatic. Well, if they're that excited about a football, Shouldn't we get excited about Yeshua? Shouldn't we get, you know, I mean, look, look what's going on in heaven. There's lightnings and rainbow and people shouting and glory, hallelujah, and on their faces and all kinds of things going on up there, a light show. I mean, I can't even imagine. Look at all the pageantry in the tabernacle system and in the, in the temple of Solomon and all that. All the choirs and the shofars and all the things going on, the shouting and the dancing. Yeah, we come to church, I don't know about you, but not here, but where I grew up and you came to church and it was a chosen frozen. Or the frozen chosen, whatever it was. You know, tombstone Christianity, you stood there, you can't move. And you just, now turn to page 532 in your hymnal and da 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 da. And you couldn't express any emotions or say anything. Any of you been in churches like that? I was raised in a church like that until I was 30. And then I got set free. I got zapped by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and then I was ruined for good. So we need to get excited about these things. There's a lot of, lot of things. You know, I could go on and on with examples. But the blood of Yeshua, the blood of Yeshua, Let's not take it for granted. It is very efficacious. It is, very, it is a very serious thing. And like I said, and I'll end with this, Revelation 12, 11, They overcame him by the blood, that's the serpent, who's going to make war against the saints. He already is, it's going to intensify. In fact, it says there is, he's going to overcome them for a while. But then they're going to overcome him, that is the serpent, Satan, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and their love not their lives unto death. When you love your life not unto death, you will not have fear, because you don't fear death. And that's the ultimate leverage that the enemy has over you, or me, or any of us, is the fear of death. Every human fear, make no mistake about it, every human fear, ultimately, you can, the lowest common denominator is the fear of death. Everything. We've talked about that before. You boil everything down is the fear of losing your life. The fear of rejection, the fear of ultimately the losing your life. And most of modern advertising um, 
is based on prom uh, promoting that fear to get you to go out and buy something. But if you don't love your life unto death, guess what? What can they do to you? You're not afraid to die. And perfect love casts out fear. If you have the love of Yeshua in you, true love, and I think, you know, we all have a lot to learn on that subject, but we have it and we're walking it out. You're not going to be afraid of that guy. You're going to want to witness to him as he's pointing a gun at you. Oh yeah, that's right. You're going to witness to him as he's pointing a gun at you. And if he doesn't speak a language that you speak, then you're going to be speaking in whatever language you know. You might have to go into your spiritual language. Or you can speak in English if he's a Russian or a Chinese or, or whatever. I don't, it doesn't matter who. And you know what? The demons that are motivating him or, or whatever will know what you're saying. Amen? And you can still have victory. And that will affect him or the army that he commands. Guys, we've got to start thinking about this stuff. Because you're not going to overcome the evil one in your own merits or because anything that you do is going to be your faith in Yeshua and your testimony and you don't love your life because you're walking in, not in fear of men, but in fear of Yehovah Elohim. The fear of the Lord of Yehovah Elohim is the beginning of wisdom. That fear casts out, um, um, well, perfect love casts out the phobos. That's the, phobos. That's, that's the Greek word, or where we get the word phobia. It casts out all fear except the fear of Elohim. Now, let me just make a dis distinction here. There is a healthy fear. I'm not talking about the kind of fear that if you look over a you know, you're on a, a ten-story building and you're looking over a cliff or something. That's, that's normal fear. That's, I'm not, if you don't have fear in those situations, you're probably crazy. Okay, you need to have fear. But I'm not talking about, I'm talking about irrational fears. But the trouble is a lot of people take irrational fear and they make that rational. And it's not. It's fear is fear is fear. So there's the irrational fear, there's the normal self-preservation fear, and then there's the fear of Elohim. I want to make those distinctions. And so, as we, as times get darker for believers, we're going to need to understand the fear of Yehovah and how the blood of the Lamb and how our testimony all work together in these things so that we can stand strong and be a victor, victor instead of a victim. That we can be the conqueror instead of the vanquished. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon his name. He is near, he is near, he is near. Yeshu Hashem Behim Atzov Kerabu
Yeshua Hashem Behimatzot 